With CoroDeans growing in popularity on more and more platforms, and recently becoming our recommended way of handling asynchronous work on Android, the ABC of CoroDeans is not just another awesome basics CoroDeans video. I'd like to go with you through some of the most common classes and functions used in CoroDeans. We'll cover concepts such as what's a CoroDeans context, job, dispatchers, and more. If you learn something new, like the video and subscribe to the channel, but only if you think we've earned it. Let's get started. The first topic to cover is coroutine scope. A coroutine scope keeps track of any coroutine you create using launch or async. Actually, these are extension functions on coroutine scope. In your app, you should create a coroutine scope whenever you want to start and control the lifecycle of coroutines in a particular layer of your app. For example, in this class that has a well-defined lifecycle, we can create a coroutine scope by calling the coroutine scope function. With this scope, we can create new coroutines, and these coroutines will follow the scope's lifecycle. We recommend using launch to get into coroutine land as opposed to async. Async is meant to return a result, which could need another coroutine, and treats exceptions a bit differently. As new coroutines created by this scope follow its life cycle, whenever the example class instance needs to be cleaned up because it's going to be destroyed, you can cancel all ongoing work automatically. Do this by calling cancel on the scope which cancels and stops executing all active coroutines. As creating and managing scopes manually might require some boilerplate, in Android, we provide KTX libraries that already provide a coroutine scope in certain lifecycle classes, such as ViewModel scope for the ViewModel class and Lifecycle scope for lifecycle owners. The ViewModel scope property is available in the ViewModel class. Any coroutine launched in this scope is automatically cancelled when the view model is cleared. Coroutines are useful here for when you have work that needs to be done while the view model is alive. Similarly, you have lifecycle scope for lifecycle owners, for example, in this app compact activity. These two scopes that we've seen run the coroutines on the main thread, as the scope is configured with dispatchers.main. To change where the coroutine runs, use a coroutine dispatcher that I'll cover in a sec. Here, we are passing dispatchers.io to load the asset from a IO-optimized thread pool. What does launch take as a parameter to allow this? Launch takes a coroutine context as a parameter. But wait, coroutine scope does it too. So what's a coroutine context? A coroutine context is an indexed set of elements that define the behavior of a coroutine. There are four elements you can use and combine in a coroutine context. We've already seen the first one. A coroutine dispatcher dispatches work to the appropriate thread. Dispatchers.io is optimized to do I.O., disk and network operations. Use dispatchers.default for CPU-intensive tasks. It uses a thread pool with the number of calls available in the device or machine, and main for everything else, UI or non-blocking code. Another element that can be added to the coroutine context is the coroutine exception handler, which is an optional element and allows you to handle uncode exceptions. Coroutine name gives a name to the coroutine, which might be useful for debugging. And the last element is of type job which controls the lifecycle of the coroutine. Not only a coroutine, but also a coroutine scope. As the coroutine scope function takes a coroutine context as a parameter, when creating a coroutine scope, you can pass in a job to control its lifecycle. But if you don't do it, the function will do it for you. So now, you can cancel the scope itself, as we did before, by calling scope.cancel, or you can cancel its job. Both options are functionally equivalent. You can combine multiple coroutine contexts using the plus operator. As the coroutine context is a set of elements, when combining them, a new coroutine context will be created with the elements of the context on the right side of the plus overriding those on the left. 
As what we have on the screen are elements of different types, the result encoding context will contain the three of them. What's important is that new coordinates created by this scope will inherit its coordinate context and will overwrite the job element with a new instance of job. To change the coroutine context within a coroutine, use with context, that is a suspend function from the coroutines library. As jobs take a key role in coroutines, let's look at them in more detail. A new coroutine returns the job with which you can control its lifecycle. In the example, we are creating a new coroutine using launch and assigning the return value to the variable job. Then, we could continue with our business logic while the coroutine is being executed. If for some reason we had to cancel the ongoing coroutine, we can call job.cancel to stop its execution. The job also influences how errors are propagated. Let's say we create this coroutine scope with a job and then launch four new coroutines. We could graphically represent them like this where its child, whose parent is the scope, is a coroutine. If one of the children fails, the failure is propagated to the parent, which will send a cancellation signal to the rest of its children. Then, the other coroutines will get cancelled, the scope will get cancelled too, and it will propagate the exception up to the thread's default exception handler. But you might not want this behavior in some cases, for example, in a UI-related coroutine scope. If a coroutine fails, you might not want the UI scope to be cancelled and therefore having a non-responsive UI. For those cases, you can use a supervisor job. With a supervisor job, the failure of a child doesn't affect other children. They won't get cancelled. Moreover, a supervisor job won't propagate the exception either, and it will let the coroutine handle it. Here, in the same situation we were before, but with a supervisor job, when a child fails, the rest of the children won't be affected. But be careful, unhandled exceptions are still propagated. If you don't handle the exception in the coroutine, you will need a coroutine exception handler in the scope. As we've seen, a coroutine scope can control the life cycle of the coroutines created by it, and the job in its coroutine context defines the error policy. To have even more control over this, when you are in a coroutine, you can create subscopes to logically group other coroutines. And this is because the outer scope suspends and won't resume until all the coroutines created within it complete. The subscopes inherits the coroutine context used in the outer coroutine and will overwrite the job element with a new job or supervisor job accordingly. In this example, we use supervisor scope in a suspend function to run two tasks in parallel. As it uses a supervisor job, if a task fails, the other one won't be affected. However, doing the same using a coroutine scope, if a task fails, the other one will be cancelled and the exception will be propagated up to the suspend function caller. Well, this was more than ABC. We also had a D for dispatchers, J for jobs, and S for scopes. But I hope you got a broad understanding of the different concepts involved in coroutines. Do you want to learn more about coroutines? For the basics of coroutines in Android, watch this Coroutines 101 talk. For more information about cancellation and exceptions, check out this talk Florina Montenesco and I gave at Kotlin Conf 2019. And to dig deeper and see how coroutines work under the hood, Watch the suspend function Kotlin vocabulary video. Thanks for watching and go write better Android apps with Kotlin.